This is lecture six in the Western intellectual tradition, and I'm going to look at the classical Greek vision of the good and look at a variety of important words in the Greek language that will help us understand how the classical Greek tradition understood the good life, the beautiful life, the true life, or the good, true, and beautiful, and what we miss by not understanding the Greek insights of the past, or caricaturing the Greek tradition without truly understanding what the Greek heritage has offered us. So I'm going to take a few terms here within the Greek language and then move through them and look at their relevance for us today. There is a tendency, as I've mentioned in previous lectures, to dismiss the past, to caricature the past, to go cherry picking with the past, uh, and thereby distorting the past by people who really do not have an adequate understanding either the language of the classical Greek tradition or the Latin tradition or the Christian tradition. And they take a few little stories, negative stories, and they, then they dismiss the 2,000 year old heritage with the wave of their shallow intellectual hands. And to understand any great civilization or heritage, it takes a great deal of time to get inside it and allow it to massage and permeate the imagination, the mind, and the soul. So what I'd like to do for the next few minutes is look at some of these terms. And then hopefully I'll follow this up with um, another lecture, which will build on that as well. So first, the term is the word arete. We get our word aristocracy from the word arete. Now, our understanding of aristocracy is certainly not how the Greeks understood aristocracy. The word aristocracy uh, comes from the idea that the there are goals worth attaining, there are ends worth living for, and um, aristocracy is not about birth and breeding, it's about a quality of the journey, it's the quality of overcoming struggles. This is why for the Greeks, agon is very important, we get a word agony, or in literature protagonists or antagonists, uh, is that the the aristocratic person or the person of arete or of quality of character uh, is the one in which who best uh, embodies what it means to live the good the meaningful the full life now arete goes in two directions in terms of quality arete can go in the direction of technique or a skill so, for example, a person who is trained in a particular skill and does very, very good at it. So, for example, a sports figure who's very gifted in hockey or football or basketball and they reach the very best of the best. They're an arate. They, there is a skill. They have an, a, a, First of all, they have a nature which inclines them in a direction, but they are trained then in that skill. They become proficient in that skill and they reach the very best in terms of that skill. And so that's arete, that's mastering a technique, a skill. They are proficient in it and they reach the very best. Same with a lawyer, a doctor, a dentist, or an electrician. Uh, so people who have uh, internalized and mastered a certain skill reach the very highest level of that particular skill they're a person of arete. Um, and so that's technique and arete in that sense. The other side, and so we get our word meritocracy from that way of thinking also, a person who develops their skill, reaches the highest level of it, and then the belief is anyone who overcomes again and again the struggles to become very the best, they, they are the ones who should rule, they are the ones who should be in a position of authority, they should be the ones who are leaders in politics or sports or, or whatever. That's meritocracy, but the Greeks were very alert to the fact that um, there's more to arete than people who are highly skilled in technique. 
because a person can be very skilled in terms of the technical abilities and bit the highest level of their field but lack a certain quality of character and this is why for them education was not just technical expertise and being proficient at the highest level but a quality of character itself and so their training in paideia or wisdom or insight and so the true person of arete or the true aristocrats in that sense were people of quality who embodied the virtues, who embodied wisdom, who embodied in insight. And so these were the people who were meant to rule eventually, not just people who are skilled in economics and politics and military accomplishments, which you get, for example, in Homer, the people of Arete were the Achilles and the Agamemnon and um, Odysseus, and Hector and people like this. So these were skilled military people but that didn't mean they were people necessarily of character and constantly you get for example phoenix who was achilles tutor when achilles goes off in a huff and doesn't want to fight phoenix has to come to him and say listen this particular hissy fit you're engaged in this is not uh, these are not the qualities of a person of arete sure you have got the great military skill but you're acting like a two-year-old because you're not getting your way or you've been offended and so phoenix comes and of course phoenix you get later phoenix the meta metaphor of the bird itself and so achilles has to go through a resurrection in terms of his own internal personality yes he can have all the skills in the world as a military person except for obviously his achilles heel but that doesn't mean his character has been refined and so as Phoenix comes along and sits with him and says, listen, you know, your character here is not one of Arete. It's one of a childlike mentality. Grow up, mature. Um, just as you've overcome odds physically in war, now you have to overcome your dark horse or your demons within that causes you to become miffed or cynical or angry because you don't feel you've been treated properly. So... <clears throat> um, mature a bit here Achilles so Phoenix becomes one in that sense who assists Achilles in resurrecting in terms of engaging his own personality at a deeper level when he's tempted towards cynicism and skepticism and anger and vindictiveness and retreating from the fray and it's Phoenix has come along so the the Greek notion then of Arete is not just people meritocracy uh, but it's also women in men who are embody courage and the virtues of wisdom and insight and justice and peacemaking and in the midst of the struggles the agon they are ones who overcome their lesser natures in terms of their greater possibilities and natures and enter the fray of life itself and that need not be military fray as you get in Homer's Iliad and Odyssey, or Thucydides or Herodotus, but um, are willing to face those weaknesses in their temperaments and overcome them. So arete then can be applied can be applied to the area of technical abilities, but the true aristocrat of the soul is a person who's concerned with the virtues, the vices, the overcoming, as I mentioned last week, the dying the dying to that which is shallow within and being birthed into their new being of uh, true citizenship in that sense. And so this notion of arete can be applied in two directions. The one of technical skills, which leads to meritocracy, but true aristocracy uh, is a person of character, a quality. And this is why within Greek thought, they, and you get this also in the biblical thought of Daniel, but you get it in Hesiod and Homer, qualities of temperament. There are people who are pure gold, there are people who are silver, there are people who are bronze, and there are people who have clay. And the true uh, person of character is one of gold. They have been refined again and again through the fires of life. And out of that, there, there are people of gold. There are lesser people of silver. There are people of bronze, and there are people of clay. And so just as there are ages within Greek thought of gold, silver, bronze, and clay, so there are people who have faced into the struggles of life they have overcome. That's why all the great Greek myths are really about overcoming 
again and again facing into the agons of life, the protagonist who faces the struggle and that the person who impose, uh, who uh, opposes them, the antagonist. So you, you get these great battles. And so life is always, from a Greek perspective, it's a battle in which a person shrinks and they become smaller and smaller and they become like clay. There's no substance to them anymore. Or in the struggles and the disappointments and the betrayals that come their way, they are the protagonists. They positively move forward. They overcome their struggle against the antagonists, the one who oppose them. And that involves agony, again, agon, uh, a struggle. And so within the Greek formation of the soul or education in that sense, or arete, what it means to be a person of quality, only in a secondary sense is it meritocracy. So we get a lot of debates in our time about egalitarianism versus meritocracy as if it's one or the other. The Greeks would have said just because a person achieves all sorts of goals in the marketplace or politics or um, a variety of skills they have exercised to make it in life, that does not necessarily mean they're a person of character or of substance. So meritocracy were not balanced by aristocracy in terms of character formation. Um, it misses the real deeper understanding of what educara means in terms of drawing out the best, the noblest, the gold versus the silver the bronze and the clay. Now underneath all of this also in the Greek notion is the idea of phusis, the nature. Each person has been given unique natures. Now in an age such as ours, which would argue that there is no structure, there is no such thing as nature, we are open-ended projects and we are both socialized conditions and then eventually we just write back and make ourselves because there is no right or wrong, there is no such thing as human nature. Um, there, there is just conditioning, socialization and then we using our freedom to make ourselves as an artist an artist would paint on a canvas, a writer would write on a blank piece of page, so we make ourselves. We are artists, essentially, that make ourselves, and we can change that from chapter to chapter, from season to season. Now, the Greeks would definitely differ with that. They would argue they each is given a nature, and freedom itself is secondary to knowing the order of one's nature. We are, again, a time where freedom, the creative artist, and their role is constantly to deconstruct any order, any structure, and that's the nature of freedom. For the Greeks, they would reverse all of that and say, you no, know, the task of knowing oneself is to know our emerging nature, and that nature has potential, and it has actualization in the nature of the journey, is to know oneself and out of that one is free. If I can use some a few examples here. Well, first of all, Aristotle, for example, would use the image from nature drawn from the the acorn and the oak. All of the, the, the largesse, the grandeur of an oak tree is all within that little acorn. Now, it's hard to believe when you think of this little, this little acorn um, becoming the oak tree or the colt becomes the horse or the calf becomes the cow or the sunflower seed becomes the sunflower plant. Uh, the Greeks would look at nature and say all things in seed form have the potential to be actualized through kinesis or movement into their actualization. But the task, the journey is always to know how to hear, to be attentive to what that actual nature is. And so it's from knowing the form or the order that one is free. Now, for example, if a, a bird basically said, I'm going to use my freedom to dive into the water and stay there, a bird would, if a, particularly a bird of flight, if it used its freedom to violate its nature, it would drown uh, because its freedom is contingent on being what it actually is. Um, an animal of flight. If a fish was conscious and it said, I'm going to use my freedom to leap out of the water and stay on the shoreline, that fish would die because its nature is to be in the water and is only truly free when it works out of its nature. 
Now, within the human condition itself, the Greeks would argue is that just as in the physical world, so in the human world physically, but more importantly, the soul and the spirit, each person has been given a unique nature in that sense. And the role of family, the role of friends, the role of education, the role of the polis or politics is to assist each person to know their unique nature and how it contributes to the body politic. That's part of a life, a life journey itself. So there is a structure built right within each person's unique identity and the role. They are only truly free when they know that. So the Greek tradition is almost the opposite of our modern significant elements of our late modern postmodern world, which argue that freedom and making and creating are what it means to be humans. The Greeks would say that's a recipe for perpetual restlessness, disorientation, and nothing can be held together in the long run if people are constantly see themselves using their liberty to make themselves as they see fit and that will change from moment to moment and season to season but in the process they have what they have done they have suppressed the very gift of the nature have they have been given to carve out if I could use Michelangelo's image he would see a stone and he would say I already see the person in the stone my job is just to chip away what is actually there to bring, for example, the David statue or any other great Greek work of, of architecture and sculpturing. You see the Greek beautiful bodies, male and female of Greek thought. Initially, they were just blocks, and the great sculptors saw within those blocks magnificent figures and sculptures, and for them it was just chipping away, chipping away um, that which prevented the form from being properly seen. And so in the human journey, the, the act of discovery and chipping away that which we are not, so we emerge in terms of who we truly are and are meant, meant to be, that's a dynamic process. It's a process, again, in which freedom is a byproduct of knowing the form, the structure of things. Use a couple of other examples. Most of us, if we thought we could use our freedom to drive on any side of the road, we would not be free to uh, on the highways or the roads. Many areas of life we presuppose a structure from which when we uh, attune ourselves to that and live from it, we are truly free. So we stay on the right side of the road, not the other side of the road. We know, for example, we're not going to we, all, of course, have the freedom to put our hand on a hot burner, but then we're not free to have healthy hands. There's a form, there's a structure, and we are constantly attuning ourselves in the physical world, either the natural world or, to some degree, the social world we inhabit. We accept the form that is given to us, and to the degree we work within that form, we are free, either to be physically healthy, to be on the roads to be healthy. Uh, uh, same with a course at university. A person can say, well, I'm not going to turn up in class. I'm not going to write the papers. I'm going to use my freedom to do that. Well, a person is free to do that, but then they're not free. They're not free to uh, pass their course, to get their degrees. So when freedom violates form, we lose freedom. That's what the Greeks would argue. Any time a person does not understand the form of which freedom is a byproduct, then they lose the very meaning of what it means to be free in a substantive sense. And so this refusis, or the nature of things, is very, very important in Greek thought as well. And so these are always, these, these, um, this, this, this growth into human nature is always understood within the context often of trial and error. Uh, in the home, which is the oikos in Greek, that's a, just the Greek word for home, the family, within the context of friends, philia, from which we get philia, sophia, uh, and then the polos itself. So these three areas are the social settings or context by which a person's nature is called forth, it's drawn forth. It's in interesting of a lot of some interesting key works like Hillman and others these days drawing from Jungian psychology 
they are going back to the old the and of course a lot of myth in that sense and Jung himself would argue Jung himself drawing deeply from Plato and classical thought argues that the whole idea of archetypes and myths are really an attempt to get back to Greek Greek understanding that there is a structure and when people violate that structure violate that structure um, they do harm they do harm to themselves and they do harm to others as well and so to some in terms of this initial part of the Greek understanding of the good the true and the beautiful which are all three different draws or areas of life that evoke the good is the moral we are drawn to something beyond a shallow understanding of ourselves a narcissistic understanding of ourselves interesting enough the greek word nar narcissist always having to look in the in the water to see his or even her reflection because the deep insecurity who am i constantly having to be reinforced that something is there even as fleeting as it is with water which does not hold an image in any way uh, so the good the good in that sense the good of the human soul to be drawn to be drawn increasingly towards a vision of, uh, of the fullness of human identity beauty plays a very important beauty can evoke within the human soul something deeper a longing for something more meaningful than truth itself as i've mentioned in uh, other lectures in terms of truth alathea uh, knocking out the, the stones, the rocks within that prevent us from seeing uh, that are, we are imprisoned in. And so a person becomes uh, truly free when they know the truth. Jesus would say you should know the truth and the truth should set you free in that sense. So the good, the true and the beautiful are in that sense uh, three welcoming um, sages in the Greek tradition that draw a person's nature into the higher level of how we are to live our life in terms of the true arete and what it means for life in the family, the oikos, friendships, philia, and the polos, the polos itself. And so in Athens high period, its classical period, it uh, articulated a variety of understandings of human nature what the truly uh, noble life the life of integrity the life of authenticity was like how it was to be lived the conditions for living it and also the distortions of it the counterfeits of it and choices made that leads to cliff's edge or where there be dragons uh, and so this, when we're thinking through then some of these uh, classical Greek thought, some of these are key terms then to understand. And in our culture wars today, there's often not a serious discussion in sort of the, the meritocracy, democracy, egalitarian issue of what quality and transformation of character is and how the Greeks understood arete beyond just perfection of skill but more importantly perfection of character itself from another greek word telos all things have their their end and the task of of each person is to know their their nature which is their end which is their perfection in the greek that greek for greeks perfection was essentially just knowing your nature and your nature will always guide you towards a its its own fulfillment with its skills its abilities and that's part of a process or kinesis we get over kinesiology from that so that's all i'll say for now there's so much more i could say and we'll be discussing that as we go further along in our western intellectual tradition